before the uh, colloquium, there is a departmental award to confer. Uh, the Kirkpatrick Teaching Assistant Awards. Over the past 30 years, the Stanford Physics Department has been pleased to award excellence among uh, our graduate teaching assistants with the Paul H. Kirkpatrick Award. This award was established to recognize those graduate students who have demonstrated a talent for and commitment to teaching and physics to undergraduates, thereby exemplifying the dual commitment to teaching and research characteristic of Paul Kirkpatrick's own scientific life. Paul H. Kirkpatrick was a distinguished member of the Stanford Physics Department for 28 years before retiring in 1960. He died in December 1992 at the age of 98. Although well known for his 40 years of X-ray research, for the invention of the X-ray microscope, and for his pioneering work in scientific holography, long before the invention of the laser, he is at least as famous for his spirited championship of the importance of furthering excellence in the teaching of physics. Paul Kirkpatrick's strength of character, integrity, and compassion were much admired by colleagues, family, and friends. Many of the Kirkpatrick awardees have gone on to distinguish teaching careers in physics. The physics department congratulates the new Kirkpatrick awardees recognized here today. And there are two of them. One is Chelsea Leekhaus Schmaltz, who I think may not be here. Is Chelsea here? Okay, so she'll receive her award later. And the other is uh, John Dodaro. John, you want to come down and receive your <laughs> work? John, among other things, PA the course I taught last quarter and kept this from being a total catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So uh, today's speaker is Percy Diaconis from the math department here. Uh, Percy is an extremely distinguished mathematician as I always do, if you have to introduce somebody distinguished, I looked up how distinguished on uh, Wikipedia, of course. And, um, okay, you know he's distinguished, but the Wikipedia article was too good, so I have to read to you from that rather than telling you about how distinguished he is. So it says, Percy Warren Diaconis, and then there's some, you know, phonetic symbols telling me how to pronounce that, <laughs> uh, is an American mathematician of Greek descent and former professional magician. The biography goes on, Diaconis left home at age 14 to travel with the sleight of hand legend Di Vernon and dropped out of high school, promising himself that he would return one day so that he could learn all the math necessary to read William Feller's famous two-volume treatise on probability theory, an introduction to probability theory and its applications, as, you know, all 14-year-old boys at the time. <laughs> uh, he returned to school, uh, City College of New York, for his undergraduate work, and then a PhD in mathema mathematical statistics from Harvard, learned to read Feller, and became a mathematical probabilist. <laughs> so it's very simple. <laughs> Uh, you know, so uh, that was interesting. So I decided that probably uh, physicists, um, magicians are more interesting. So I decided to see uh, about Di Vernon. And well, that's actually really interesting, but I won't read you about that. Other than at the end of his biography, we see that there is some reciprocity about Vernon. They said Vernon spent his last this 30 years of his life as magician in residence and star attraction at the Magic Castle in Los Angeles, California. There he mentored numerous well-known magicians, including Ricky Jay, Percy Diaconis, Doug Henning, and others, so at least it's reciprocal. Uh, so then I went on to look up Doug Henning. <laughs> at any rate, today's speaker is Percy Diaconis, who will tell us about adding numbers and shuffling cards. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, so it, it's a, a question I brood about. Um, uh, mathematics and physics have many points of, of contact, and, and yet somehow they're <laughs> and, uh, uh, a biologist, and Shamit was there too, so you can ask him. <laughs> And uh, the, the, the guy said, well, of course, mathematicians aren't scientists. And I am, what? Um, and it's a question, are mathematicians scientists? And you can all think about that. That's not really an appropriate topic for a colloquium. But um, one thing that, uh, that made me bristle is what I think I do is look at the world and try to make sense out of it. And I think that's what people in physics do, too. Um, mathematicians look at lots and lots of data and try to find patterns in it and make sense. And then we have universal type signatures that we say, well, if we see this, it means this theory is like that theory. And so there, there are a lot of points of contact. And I'll come back to that at the end, uh, and I'm going to start at, at the beginning now. Uh, uh, so this talk is called Adding Numbers and Shuffling Cards. And first problem is how to do this. Um, and just, I know this is a very distinguished group and audience, but let's start at the beginning. Uh, okay. <laughs> When numbers are added in the usual way, there are carries sometimes. Uh, this, is a, this is a nine, this is a two, this is a one, this is an eight, this is a, there's no carry, this is a nine, this is a zero, this is a one, this is a six, right? Um, and uh, so there are carries that occur along the way. And if you're like me, or hopefully like you after this talk, um, it's not an unnatural question, how do the carries go? You know, that is, for typical numbers, is there a carry, you know, half the time? Uh, um, if you just had a carry, is it a little more likely or a little less likely that there's a carry? So how do the carries go? And um, uh, so that, let me start by talking about that. That's uh, has some contact with the real world. And um, let me make some, let, let me write this down. So first of all, I'll, I'll I'll add, you know, n numbers, uh, and instead of working base 10, I'll work base b, but it's not such a big deal. So if I was doing that, I'd have my first column, which I'll call x, the zeroth column, x2, 0, up to xn, 0, and then x11, x21, up to x n1 and dot 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 right and I'd be adding them and um, at the top every once in a while I'd have a carry so you, you never have a carry in the first column and I'm going to call the carries this Greek letter kappa kappa zero kappa one kappa two etc um, and you know there's some sums and um, and um, so you know kappa zero the kappa zero is zero and if you think about it if I add n if I add two numbers you either have a carry of zero or one if you add n numbers no matter what happens you either have a carry of zero one up to n minus one you could have a carry up to n minus one so um, zero less than or equal to kappa i less than or equal to n minus one those are the those are the carries and. Um, I want to ask how the carries go. And um, a first observation uh, is that the carries form a Markov chain. So let me write that down, uh, carries, and explain it. Markov chain. Here's, so first of all, I better tell you where my numbers are coming from. I'm going to talk about typical numbers, and um, so my xi's uh, are, are going to be um, uh, 0 less than or equal to xi less than or equal to b minus 1. So they, if, if I was working base 10, xi's are between 0 and 9, and I'm going to take my digits to be random, uniform, and independent of each other. So I'm going to talk about typical numbers, and we can change that, but 
there's enough to say without changing it. And so if I specify that my digits are chosen at random, then there's some, what's the chance that you have a carry, you know, what the kappa one is seven, that kind of question, um, you can ask. And the carry, carries form of Markov chain means this. Um, if, if I tell you the, 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 the fifth carry and all the carries before, and I ask what's the chance the next carry is something, that only depends on the past through the present. That is, I don't care what these are. If you tell me this, these digits are independent. This and these random digits determine this. So the carries, the, the, the probability that the elf carry um, uh, is equal to j given uh, uh, carry 1 up to carry uh, l minus 1 um, only depends on um, only depends on uh, uh, the last one is equal to the chance uh, 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 that uh, kappa l is equal to j given kappa l minus one. So that's what it means to say something something forms a Markov chain. So it's like the laws of mechanics: uh, the future depends on the past only through the present and the velocities. Okay. Um, uh, Markov chains are the stochastic, a stochastic analog of that. Um, and so what that means is that there's a matrix um, um, Pij, uh, um, which is what's the chance that the next carry is J given that the last carry was I? Right, that's, that's a at some, the sum transition matrix. And I'd like to say I invented that matrix, but it wasn't that way at all. I was visiting Nice in Nice and desperate not to do some task using somebody else's office. And, uh, and they had some copies of a semi-popular journal, the American Math Monthly, on their wall. And uh, gee, rather than do that, I wonder what's in the monthly. <laughs> so I, I, I picked up uh, an issue of the journal and I saw an article which was called um, uh, Carries Combinatorics and an Amazing Matrix. And my first reaction was, are there any amazing matrices? Come on, you know, really? I mean, uh, it's still a, it's, it's a good journal, the monthly, and come on, what are you talking about? So the matrix they were talking about is this matrix. And just, again, to give you a, a sentence about it, let's, let's do a slightly, a very easy one, which is um, if I add two digits at random, how do the carries go? So l let me, let's think about that. Yes? Would be better. I can, I'm happy to try it. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'll try it. Take a vote. Uh, no, good. Uh, uh, um, so, um, so let's suppose we add two numbers, two digits. So the digits can be um, uh, 0, 1, up to 9, and 0, 1, up to 9. These are my two digits. If I add 0 to anything, I, I don't get a carry, right? So, okay. Thank you. Uh, if I add zero to anything, I don't get a carry, right? If I add one, I only get a carry if I add it to nine, right? And so there are zeros here. If I add two, I get a carry here, and they're all zeros. And if I add nine, I get carries all the way along, um, uh, except if I add it to zero. So this matrix has one, two, up to B minus one, uh, B minus two carries. So this 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 matrix, you know. The, so if I pick two, so the the number of ones, the number of carries uh, is if if I was working base B is uh, the binomial co coefficient B choose two. And since I'm going to pick my digits at random, the chance of a carry is the number of ones in this matrix divided by B choose two, and 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 that's um, that's one half minus one over two B. Um, and so when B is ten, that's forty five percent. Uh, 
I guess. And so a little less than half the time, if you pick two digits at random, you have a carry. And this is a slightly fancier version of that because it's, it's, um, it's, it's well, it's got all of this dependence on, on the past in it. Um, so uh, there was a handout for this talk. And uh, if you have access to it, good. Uh, if you don't, um, so <laughs> good too. It'll be OK. You won't die. Um, uh, so if I add two numbers, um, uh, n is 2, uh, uh, just two numbers like that, th this transition matrix, um, uh, you know, p, i, j, uh, now i and j are only 0 and 1. I can only have a carry of 0 and 1. It's this, um, uh, it's this matrix, uh, b plus 1, b minus 1, b minus 1. B plus one, and by a calculation of that sort, I mean it's a little little two by two matrix. That's the that's the transition matrix. When when n is three, um, I wrote it down because I don't want to make more of a mess than I have to. And it's some three by three matrix. Uh, you you either have a carry of zero, one, or two if you add three numbers. 0, 1, or 2. And I wrote down the matrix on the handout. And one thing to notice is it's not a symmetric matrix. Uh, and it's not self-adjoint in any natural inner product. So um, it's just some funny matrix. And I, I wrote it down in general. And I won't do it again. But if you look at this matrix when B is in, um, it's a mess. and. Uh, and so, you know, there I am looking at it. And what's so amazing about this matrix? This is, this is supposed to be the amazing matrix. OK, so what's, so what's so amazing about it? The guy who wrote the article is a guy named John Holt. Um, and um, uh, I'll tell you some of the things that he found about the matrix. Um, and that'll, I'll translate them into carries. Um, the, the, the first thing he found is that even though it's not a self-adjoint operator, um, the matrix has all real eigenvalues. Um, all real eigenvalues. I still don't conceptually know why. Of course, we can prove it. Um, but maybe somebody here can think of why that's true. And they're equal to 1. It's a stochastic matrix, the, the rows sum to 1. 1 over b, uh, 1 over b squared, um, 1 over b to the n minus 1. So it's, a, it's an n by n. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, I'm adding n numbers, and uh, you know, so it's an n by n matrix, and and those are the those are the eigenvalues. So, so that's nice. Um, the second thing is, what's the stationary distribution? Um, so, if I add three numbers, you know. How often do I have a carry of 0, 1, or 2? Is it a third of the time, or what is it? So that's what this question is answering. The stationary distribution, pi of i, um, uh, is a left eigenvector with eigenvalue 1, satisfies the sum of pi of i, uh, p i j, is equal to pi of j. So i equals 0 to n minus 1. So that's the chance of having a carry of, of i as you go, as, as you go along uh, looking at the top. And what is that? Well, he found um, uh, that pi of i um, was a nice number. It's um, a n i um, divided by n factorial. Um, uh, and where a n i, uh, the Eulerian number it's called, um, Um, it's the equal to the number of permutations, um, uh, I'll call them sigma, uh, with i descents. So let me explain that. Um, uh, so a permutation there's a permutation. It, you can look at the up-down pattern. So here it went from 6 to 1, so it has a descent here. Here it went from 7 to 3. Here it went from 5 to 2, and then from 9 to 4. So this permutation had four descents, 
Okay, so if this permutation was sigma, um, the d number of descents in sigma is four, and um, uh, ANI, um, numbers that Euler studied, uh, are, are the number of permutations which have I descents. And gee, that's a, f you know, what are, what are permutations doing here? I mean, you know, if you, if you have any curiosity at all, you know, where does that come from? Um, the, uh, all the eigen, the eigen values depend on B, but the eigenvectors were free of B. Okay. The third thing um, that he discovered um, was, okay, so this matrix, um, this ma not this matrix, um, this matrix, uh, of course, depends on B. So, you know, it's a little silly, but you can't stop me from multiplying them. Uh, if I take you know, if I'm working base A and then I'm working base, I have two matrices, I can multiply them, okay? Well, this is P of A times B. So, so when I saw that, I'm afraid, I shrieked out, hey, this is all about shuffling cards. And for those of you who know me, uh, well, you think for Diaconus, everything is all about shuffling cards, right? <laughs> and so, the next task in this talk is to try to explain to you how this amazing matrix um, is all about shuffling cards. But just before that, let me, let's do it out for um, when n is three, um, uh, just as an aside. Um, so there are six, there are six permutations um, in, in, of three things. And, um, uh, the identity, uh, uh, so um, 0, 1, uh, 2, the, the number of descents in a permutation, if they're in reverse order, then you have two descents, uh, and uh, it, it goes like this. So the, the, the identity, it goes up 1, 2, 3, has no descents. The reverse permutation um, has two descents, and the other four permutations you can write down on your piece of paper have one descent. And so what this theorem says is that um, pi three, when you add three numbers uh, in any base, uh, uh, pi three of zero is a sixth, uh, pi three of one, the chance of one descent is, um, is two thirds, uh, and uh, pi three of two is uh, a sixth. So, I, you know, might not be the first thing you guessed at, um, and it doesn't depend on the base, um, and uh, this tells you the answer in general. Okay, so in order to explain this is all about shuffling cards, I have to tell you a little bit about shuffling cards. Okay, so, um, uh, new talk starting. Right. So I was, you know, doing a little math or whatever I was doing. It's a new talk, okay. So, um, so there's a question. Uh, how many times do you have to shuffle a deck of cards to mix it up? Um, and um, that's going to be on my tombstone in case it's late. You know, the answer's about seven. Go back to sleep. But, okay, I want to parse that, make it into some kind of math sense and, uh, and, and be, able to state, be able to state a theorem. Um, and I, I put that down, which I shouldn't have done, but I have gorgeous ones here, so you're, you're gonna be able to read perfectly. So here's my new talk starting. So I'm talking about permutations, so I'm, I'm working on, uh, or, you know, I call it SN, the symmetric group, all, all n factorial, uh, permutations and mixed up means at the moment it's the limiting perfect mixing um, so the uniform distribution I'll call it u of pi u of sigma say uh, is 1 over n factorial I want to shuffle so that all permutations are, are, are close to random. Now, when people know, you know, say I do that, they say, well, can't you do that on a computer? Well, 52 factorial is 10 to the 68th, and if all of, you know, computers in the world were working for the age of the universe, they're not gonna run through all permutations of 52 cards. So, nope, you can't do it on a computer, you have to think, thank goodness. Um, there's something left you can't do on a computer. Um, now, so, so that's going to be what I mean by mixed. 
And um, what do I mean by shuffle? Well, I, I mean what you probably mean, which is you have a deck of cards and you cut them about in half and go, right? No. So I have to make math out of that. So how uh, do I make math out of that? So here's shuffle. Um, and so I first, I, I cut off, I have n cards. I cut off j with probability uh, uh, the discrete version of the bell-shaped curve uh, over a 2 to the n. So I cut off around half the deck. You know, you know people usually don't cut perfectly. And um, so that, that somehow... Then I start dropping the cards with my thumbs in the following way. If at some stage in the left hand I have A cards and in the right hand I have B cards, um, uh, the chance that I drop the next card from my left probability for, of left uh, is proportional to packet size. And so, you know, it's more springy, whatever. Um, uh, there are various things to say about this um, model. First of all, that completely describes a, the, a, a, a model of shuffling. You just keep iterating that. And if you run out of all the cards in your left hand, this has you drop all the rest on top of it. It's called the Gilbert Shannon Reads model. And um, uh, it's the maximum entropy distribution, so it's the most random distribution consonant with the physics of, of, of shuffling. And um, the, um, a reason for thinking about it or discussing it um, is that it's a very good model for the way real people shuffle cards. Um, and, uh, and I know that because I do experiments. Okay? I ask people to shuffle cards and I compare. It's not a good model for the way I shuffle cards. I shuffle cards almost perfectly. Cut, cut them exactly in half and one, 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 one. And if you do that eight times, they come back to where they started. Okay. <laughs> so neat shuffles is not a good way to, uh, to shuffle cards, it's, and, uh, of course. And this is, in, in a provable, clear sense, the most random. And mean, meanwhile, it's, um, it's a probability distribution on, on, on shuffles. Now that's shuffle once, and we're going to repeat it, so let's do that. Let's say that. So P star P of sigma, so in English, the chance of being at the arrangement of the deck sigma after two shuffles, um, this is, by definition, um, uh, P of eta, um, uh, P of uh, sigma eta inverse. And all this says is in order to have the deck in arrangement sigma, you had to have done something your first shuffle and chosen the permutation that gets you to sigma your second shuffle. So similarly, we can define you know, the k-fold iteration, iteration, the chance of being in a deck of cards in, in uh, being in arrangement sigma after, um, uh, after k shuffles. So and it's a fact, it's due to Poincaré uh, around 1890, uh, little theorem, uh, that uh, uh, if you shuffle a lot, uh, uh, you go to the uniform distribution. Now, you all knew that. <laughs> you know, if you shuffle cards a lot, they get all mixed up. And a question becomes, how fast, how, because 10 to the 68th is a lot of shuffles. <laughs> so do you need to do something like that? Or, you know, seven is different than 10 to the 68th. So uh, in, order to, um, in order to go there, I need to um, say what it means to be close to random. And um, there's a standard distance that we use, the distance between shuffling k times and uniform. Uh, it's equal to the maximum, uh, I'll parse this, over A, uh, permutations A, of P star K of A minus U of A. Uh, and so let me try to parse this. A is a subset of permutations. For example, all permutations where the ace of spades is in the top half. 
P star K of A is what's the chance that the deck is in that set of arrangements after K shuffles. U of A is suppose the cards are really all mixed up as well as can be perfectly. What's the chance of, of A? And this says take the difference between these two numbers and then take the worst case. So if this is small, less than a hundredth, less than a thousandth. If this is small, it means that for any task, you've shuffled enough. Um, and um, now before continuing, um, there is a question I'm going to take time to ask. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm about to do a little math. And, and before I continuing, uh, let's, let me get to this question. So I, okay, so let me, so um, uh, that is, uh, you know, everybody knows if you shuffle a deck of cards three, four, five times, they're all mixed up, and what are you doing math for? And like so many other things that everybody knows, it's just wrong, that's all. And uh, um, to demonstrate that, um, uh, let me suggest a card trick that you can try after this talk. Uh, and it goes like this. So there's nice Steve Kivelson and, uh, and uh, well, and suppose, you know, he's going to Zurich tomorrow. And, and I say, okay, Steve, you know, here's a deck of cards, take it with you, and when you're in Zurich, read the letter. So there he is now, he's in Zurich. And uh, the letter says, um, uh, take the cards out of the case, um, uh, give them a cut, cuts them. Give him a shuffle. Shuffles. Give him another cut. Cuts them. Give him another shuffle. Cut him a few more times. Cut, cut, cut. I'm sure you'll agree no living human could know the name of the top card. Now that sounds right. I'm not peeking in the window. I mean, I, I might, but Zurich is far away. Okay, take that card off. Look at it. Remember it. Say it's the six of hearts. Put it in the middle of the deck. And now give the deck another cut, give it another shuffle, give it a few more cuts, mail me back the deck. And at seven o'clock every evening, please concentrate on your card. <laughs> and eventually he gets a letter or a communication that says it's the six of hearts. And you know, and it is the six of hearts. So uh, what? <laughs> you would have forgotten by then, right? Write it down, I know you. Right. Um, so I want to um, I want to talk about that uh, um, just for a minute, because first of all, you can try it, and secondly, it'll give you some insight. You know, if you shuffle a deck of cards once, why isn't it random? So let's, let's talk a little bit about the physics of shuffling cards. Here's a deck of cards, and of course, I write down the order of the deck I sent them. You know, so I know, suppose they're in order one up to n. He shuffles once, some way. I don't care how he shuffles. You know, I know him. He's a klutz. Um, uh, uh, so he shuffles once. No matter how he shuffles, the deck after the shuffle has two rising sequences, right? He, the top half, wherever he cut, is in the same order after shuffle. And the bottom half is in the same order after shuffle, right? Now, I wish I could do this, but I can't. Now let's look at the second shuffle. He cuts off the top half of the deck. That has two rising sequences in it. And the bottom half has two rising sequences in it. When he shuffles, the deck has four rising sequences. Yeah. After a third shuffle, the deck will have eight rising sequences. When he takes the top card off, looks at it, remembers it, puts it in the middle, it makes a ninth rising sequence of length one. So what do I do when I get back the deck? I just start playing solitaire. I turn up the top card, say it's the queen of diamonds. If the next card's the king of diamonds, I'd play it on the queen. But suppose it's the nine of spades. I start a new pile. There's the ten of hearts, boom. Ah, there's, the, there's the king of diamonds, I play it on the queen. I just start playing solitaire, putting cards on one another if they come adjacent in the original order of the deck. Okay. Um, what you try, if you, if what you'll find if you try it, and I recommend it, is you'll wind up with eight piles, each about an eighth of the deck, and a ninth pile of size one. Okay. So, uh, uh, so you can try that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a trick of Charles Jordan, and there's a wonderful stories about it, but not right now. Um, uh, so. Um, so three shuffles is not enough to mix up 52 cards. Okay. Similarly, 
Five shuffles are not enough to mix up 52 cards. Why? After five shuffles, you can have at most 32 rising sequences. A random order of the deck has around 26, uh, around 26 rising sequences, but you, you, it's very likely to, to be 32-2, and uh, you miss a fair proportion of the orders of the deck. And I call to your attention, I don't care how he shuffles. He can remember from time to time. He can do a really klutzy shuffle. He can do a perfect shuffle. After five shuffles, you're not anywhere near like on, on all permutations. So, okay. Um, I'm going to get rid of this. But uh, there are many other reasons for who cares, but that's another, another story. And I keep putting the nice pen down, and here it is again. Okay, so um, I want to tell you the answer to this question. The question is, um, uh, the question is, with all of this specified, I have a math question. Um, uh, given uh, epsilon bigger than zero, how large k? so that the distance of shuffling k times to uniform is less than epsilon. It's, it's never perfect. I mean, it's never equal to zero. There's always some remembrance of the, re of the rest of the deck. But this is a well-posed math question. And I'm going to tell you the answer in two different ways. First, with numbers when n is 52. So let's say that first. So um, uh, let's say that. Uh, so here's um, k, the number of shuffles. Here's the distance. And here's the number of shuffles. Okay. So this distance that I'm using is the difference between two numbers which are between 0 and 1. So it's between 0 and 1. And it's 0 if the two distributions are exactly the same. And it's 1 if they live on disjoint subsets, if they're completely different. After one shuffle, uh, the distance uh, when k is 1 is 1.000. Oh, oh, oh. uh, two shuffles, 1.0. No notes. <laughs> now, this number is really 0.9999999. 11 or 12 places, but I didn't think you want to know that. Uh, it's very, very close to as big as it can be. At 5, something happens. Uh, it goes down to 0.924, and then it goes down to 0.628, and then it goes down to about 32, and, uh, and then it goes down to 0.16, and then it goes down to 0.08, and, and it, it continues um, uh, decreasing by powers of 2, and that happens forever. Okay, um, and um, so I can't tell you how many times you have to shuffle a deck of cards. You have to tell me what epsilon is. So if the national security depends on it, shuffle 11 times, you know. But if you give me a epsilon, I can tell you how large k so that, so that you're within epsilon of, of, of shuffling. So that's what it looks like uh, with numbers. Let me tell you what it looks like as a theorem in math. Um, uh, and this is work I did with Dave Beyer. Um, um, so uh, here it goes. The distance uh, between shuffling k times and uniform. So uh, suppose k, the number of times I'm shuffling, is 3 halves log to the base 2 of n plus c. Um, this goes this way. Um, and um, so let me try to explain that. You know n. Um, that, that's the size of the deck, n is 52 or whatever it is. You know k, how many times you want to shuffle, so this equation determines c as a function of n and k. And this distance um, is equal to 1 minus 20, I'll, I'll parse this, uh, minus 2 to the minus c over 4 times the square root of 3 plus big O, 1 over root n. Um, and um, so let me try where phi is the normal distribution function. Phi of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi. So it's impossible to parse this, so I'll draw a picture of it. Um, but um, what's important is this C is this C, okay? And as C gets large, 
this goes to zero exponentially fast, and you can see the powers of two coming in. And when C gets, if C is negative, it might be you're shuffling less than this, then the normal, the asymptotics of, of the bell-shaped curve, this goes to one doubly exponentially fast. And so if you draw a picture of this, here's K, the number of times you shuffle, here's the distance, um, uh, P star K minus U, um, um, and it looks like this, and this happens at three halves long to the base two of n. So there's a, a sharp phase transition um, uh, when n is large um, at three halves log to the base two of n. And, and okay, I want to say that these numbers actually don't come from this approximation. Dave Beyer, who I wrote the paper with, is a you know a computer addict, and I know these numbers exactly to seventy rational you know they're t rational numbers. I just you don't want to see them, but if you do, there some of them are in the paper we wrote. Um, so that's the answer. That's a little bit of the background about shuffling cards. So you, that, that's a little bit about shuffling cards. So now in order to, so, so right, I've given two talks, right? <laughs> They're supposed to be connected. <laughs> so let me try to tell you what the connection is. What's the connection between the two talks? So. Um, uh, I have to tell you a little bit more about shuffling cards, and so uh, let me give a different model for the same process. Um, this is the geometric model for shuffling. Take the unit interval. Here's zero, here's one. Okay, just put endpoints down at random. There's one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Okay, another one, another one, another one. And label them left to right in increasing order x1, x2 x3, xn, okay? So mathematically, n, n points chosen from the uniform distribution on the unit interval. And now do the Baker's transformation. Uh, the Baker's transformation is x goes to twice x mod 1. Okay? So that takes the unit interval and it spreads it out and folds it unto itself. What does it do? Um, well, it takes the left half of the interval, zero to a half, and it spreads it out. It takes the right half of the interval, it spreads it out, and then it pushes them together. These points will permute after a Baker's transformation. And if you think about it, it's exactly a shuffle. There are a binomial number of points in the left-hand half, and, and then they shuffle together. And the math of the permutation is exactly the Gilbert Shannon reads. Uh, measure. It's a little easy lemma. So, okay, that's, that's good. Um, uh, and now, having seen that, it's pretty natural to think about doing an A shuffle. Um, uh, so you could try X goes into AX mod 1. Uh, I wish I knew how to do it when A was an integer. I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to do the math, but A is an integer. Um, one, two, three, etc. A is fixed, but so what's a three shuffle? Well, in this language, I, if A is three, I take a left third, I take the middle third, the right third, I stretch them all out and they go together. With cards, it's the following. You have a deck of cards, you cut it into three piles according to a trinomial distribution, and then with your three hands, you start dropping the cards with probability proportional to packet size. Okay, it's exactly the same as what I talked about before, and um, that's a three shuffle. Um, uh, so, um, what's the, what made me think that adding had something to do with shuffling? Well, um, uh, let's try to say, so uh, repeated shuffling is a Markov chain on the permutation group. Um, uh, if you um, uh, repeated, uh, let me, B shuffling, call AB, has uh, eigenvalues Uh, one, one over b, one over b squared, one over b to the n minus one. Okay. Um, more tellingly, um, uh, if I do an a shuffle uh, followed by a b shuffle, 
that's an AB shuffle. And that's easy to see uh, from this description. If I, if I take x and I go to ax mod 1 and then I go to, from there to bx mod 1, that's the same as going from x to a, you know, a times b mod 1. So this is easy. Um, uh, and in our analysis in proving this theorem, Eulerian numbers, the, the combinatorics of descents, was all over the place. So now you're where I was. Um, so I knew this stuff about, about adding numbers. I, I knew this stuff about shuffling. It has to be there's a connection. I mean, you know, it just can't be that this is an accident. So that's the kind of thing that happens. And if you can figure out why, it, life goes forward. Um, so I want to tell you the connection just in a, in a, in a sentence. Um, uh, um, so what's the, now I can, you see why I leapt out and said this adding stuff is all about shuffling cards. Um, and so what's the connection? So I'm just going to tell you. Um, uh, so uh, the, I have two processes. The first is the carries process. Look at the chance that if you uh, add n numbers uh, base b, um, that uh, what's the probability that, uh, well, you, k0, of course, is 0, kappa 1 is equal to, so call it j1, uh, kappa 2 is equal to j2. What's the chance of getting, you know, a given sequence of carries, say kappa l is equal to jl? That, that's one collection of numbers, right? That, that's, uh, that's the probability distribution assigned uh, with carries. Okay. The second thing is um, uh, uh, repeatedly B shuffle in cards. And look at the number of descents. Um, uh, what's the probability that, well, uh, you start with the deck in order, uh, D0 um, is, um, is 0, uh, that D1, uh, I'll explain this, is, is, is J1, that DL is equal to J sub L. Um, so you shuffle the cards once. You have some arrangement. Look at how many descents there are. Shuffle it again. Look at how many descents there are. Every time you shuffle, count up the number of descents. That generates a process. You start with the cards in order. These two things are equal. Equal, equal. Not asymptotically, not approximately. Equal. Uh, so, equal. Equal. So that's a theorem that I proved with Jason Fullman, and there's a hard proof, and then there's an aha proof, um, a better proof than the hard proof anyway. Um, and um, I, um, so that, that does say they're connected, and uh, if there were time, but I, I do want to explain one thing, a more conceptual, um, uh, I would try to answer the kind of question my mom would have asked, and she said, so? <laughs> this is what you do, you shuffle cards, you add numbers. <laughs> what did we learn about carries from shuffling theory? What did we learn about shuffling theory from carries? And there are good answers to both of them. Uh, and I, I'm just, there's not time, but I did hand out a sheet of references. And we really did answer questions that computer scientists had pondered about, about carries, uh, about carries make a mess in arithmetic, and they want to know how it goes. And, and, uh, and knowing this connection allowed us to answer questions about shuffling that we didn't know. What I want to do is I want to try to give you an idea of why this is true. Because uh, at the moment, it's just a miracle occurred, right? So that's, that's one argument. Uh, good. Um, so I know this is a great physics department. And I, you know, when I started, you think, what is this guy adding numbers? Maybe you still think that. I don't know. Um, uh, how low can you go? Here I go. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to add a single column of numbers now. <laughs> Let's try it. 
Okay. Let's, you can check me, that's 13, 17, 23, 31, 39, um, 48, 51. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody likes that. I'm going to do it again slower. Okay. <laughs> and we'll, we'll check this. Um, so I'm going to start from the top. Here's three. I just, now, nine and three are 12. And so I write the remainder. And to show that I had a carry, I put a dot here. Eight and two are 10. So when there's, a, there's a carry. Eight and zero are eight. Uh, six and eight are 14. And there's a carry. Um, I, six and eight are 14. Four and four are eight. Um, five and eight are 13. And there's a carry. Um, uh, eight, that's a one. And there's a carry here. Right? So there are five dots. And the, the remainder is a one. And so that's our 51. Ta-da! No. Um, uh, this idea of using dots in order to make accuracy in arithmetic is a standard trick of bookkeepers. And it, it, when I grew up, they were selling, and they're still selling, the Trachtenberg system of speed arithmetic, which is how to use dots to not make mistakes. It's a, it's a useful thing. Um, if at the end, by, the, by this point in the talk, you can know the next line, which is, OK, if I have random digits, how do the dots go? <laughs> you know, how many times is there a carry? And if there's a carry, is it more or less likely that there's a carry after that? To help motivate that and to tell you it has some legs, um, let me make the following observation. Um, if these digits are independent and uniform on 0 up to b, 0 up to 9 here, I claim these digits are independent and uniform. Why is that? Well, certainly 3, I just copied it. It's uniform on 0 to 9. If you add a random number to 3, the result is random and independent of 3. Right? And so these numbers are independent and uniform. And there's a carry if and only if there's a descent. I went from 3 to 2. I went from 2 to 0. I went from 8 to 4. I went from 8 to 3, 3 to 1. And you can check that. Okay. So, the mathematics of these dots is the same as it's a basic question in probability. Take a random sequence. How many? What's the up-down pattern in 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 the um, in this? How many descents are there? <laughs> okay. So from this, you can see that the mathematics of carries is c related to the to the mathematics of descents. I'm not going to say more about it. But if you beef this argument up, you can make this kind of aha argument and prove this equality. And that's in the monthly paper that I, that I wrote about. And if you like math or other kinds of things, um, these dots uh, form a one dependent determinal point process. And it has beautiful properties. And OK. So I want to end with two sentences. Um, uh, so I, I do think I try to tell you the connection between carries and, um, and shuffling. Um, and, but then I can step back and ask, well, what are carries anyway? What are carries as part of math? Carries are carries. We just learn about them, right? So what are carries? What are? <laughs> Carries. <laughs> okay, and there's an answer, which is if G is a group uh, uh, and H is a subgroup, um, uh, then um, you can choose coset representatives, X contained in G, such that um, uh, G, you know, is the union of X times H, um, X um, contained in X. Um, uh, so groups and subgroups, you can choose coset representatives. Now, alas, the product of two coset representatives isn't always a coset representative. So example, if G is um, uh, C 100, the integer is mod 100, and uh, just 100 points around the circle, and H um, is um, the integer is mod 10, but it has to be a subgroup. So that's 0, 1, 0, 10, 20 up to 90. So this subgroup is the integers mod 10 sitting in C100. And um, coset representatives for this subgroup in this group are the digits. Um, so x is equal to 0, 1, up to 9. Right? 
Now, the, the, the point is, the sum of two coset representatives isn't always a coset representative. Of course not. I mean, otherwise the extension would split and there is no complementary subgroup to C10 and C100. I mean, so extension doesn't split. And, and when there are carries, so they're, they're called co-cycles in group theory. So, so carries are co-cycles. And, um, and realizing that, you can do everything that I did about carries, you can do for any group and any subgroup, including continuous groups. And, and have a group, you have a subgroup, you choose coset representatives, there's an analog of this, there's a determinantal point process. You can say all kinds of math, and, and, and it's an interesting subject. And I put a reference to the paper I wrote with Alexi Borodin and Jason Fullman, um, and it's got lots and lots of examples. Um, the final thing, to, I won't answer it really, but so what are carries, carries or co-cycles? What are shuffles? Well, if you, learn combinatorics or like combinatorics or know about differential forms where if you multiply two differential forms the way you multiply two differential forms is you have to sum over all shuffles of, of if you multiply a two form times a three form it's for, since Grassman we understand that that shuffling is a basic ingredient of algebra and I, I'm sorry I, there isn't really time to um, to tell you that but it is the case that because I know a lot about shuffling I do know we have contributed to all kinds of areas of, of algebra, um, uh, Hochschild homology and Hopf algebras and other things like that. Um, so this talk was meant to, well, do two things. One is it's meant to give you an indication of the kinds of workaday work that an applied mathematician does um, and whether you have answers to my questions at the end, uh, at the beginning of the talk or not, um, I think that you'll leave here knowing that there's a connection between carries and shuffling. Thank you. So are there questions? So, so I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, this, this shuffling is sort of like a system reaching equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But as physicists, we might have asked something somewhat different, which is how do correlation functions approach their equilibrium values? Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, what is the chance that you have a club next to a mm -hmm. heart or something like that? Is that? Yes, so, so features, I call it features. And first of all, it's important you might only care about, you know, if you're playing blackjack, the, the, the suits don't matter and tens, jacks, queens, and kings don't matter. So first of all, you know, cruder questions can be of interest. And um, uh, actually, the correlation between, uh, between two cards is nicely described because of this connection. So there's a story, but I, we've done it. And, uh, and we, we know the, the shape and how it depends on, on what question you're asking and k-point correlations and et, et cetera. So there, there is the question I'm asking is that this yes. thing seems very unusual, this, that it, Good. it, it Bless doesn't, you. It doesn't, Thank you for noticing. <laughs> yeah. Nothing happens and then suddenly right. something happens. We sort of think of things approaching Right. More. So that was one of our real discoveries is this cutoff phenomenon it's called. And if you type in cutoff phenomena, um, uh, the first Markov chain I ever analyzed was uh, end cards flat out on the table, pick a card with your left hand, pick a card with your right hand, swap them, you know, when they, they get all mixed up. And there was a cutoff, just the same kind of theorem that happened at a half n log n plus cn. And um, the first half dozen chains I analyzed had cutoffs. And for a while we thought they all have cutoffs. They don't. Simple random walk, if you go drunkard's walk on endpoints around the circle, that does just what you said. And one of the problems is to prove and understand when there's a cutoff and when there's not. And, and, but if you type in Percy and cutoff, 
you will find more than you want to know. Uh, no, it was a discovery. That, and it came from just being careful about doing the math. Uh, um, there, there, you know, there, are, there are two limits. But you know, the numbers I put up, these are exact numbers. There is a cutoff. It's, that's where I say seven shuffles. It does cut down at seven, and then it goes exponentially fast to zero. I mean, so my image is I have a big bucket a glass bowl, and there are black beads on the top and white beads on the, and I have a, a canoe paddle, and I go like this, right? And what you would see is there are big swaths still of black and white, big, and then all of a sudden it gets gray, and it stays gray. I mean, that's the image I have, and there's many, many examples in which we're able to prove it, and, and it's, a, it's a world in which we invent, it's a new phenomena, and it came from shuffling. So, thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I have one. Hi. So there were two technical details uh, here that I, of course, didn't follow, but let me ask a question anyway. So one of them is the specific statistical description of A shuffle, mm -hmm. which was at Hope. Mm -hmm. It's a good, but it's... I, it's did, I did try it out on people. I, as I asked people to I shuffle say cards. It was bad. Okay, so here comes the question. Yeah, but it's made up. It's, it's made up. up, okay. Like what you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so hurts. <laughs> All right, and then the other thing is uh, the metric. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's made up too. And, mm, yes. and so, how much of the exactness of the, of the comparison of one problem to the other? rests on your choice okay. of the specific shuffle algorithm or, or mm -hmm. model okay. or Markov kernel mm -hmm. and the metric. Right. So the metric question I can answer, um, if you use entropy as a metric or if you use L2 or you know any reasonable metric on probability distributions, you get exactly the same result. There's a cutoff. If you use entropy, you know, the entropy when the cards are in order is very big, and so what happens is it drops sort of linearly, and then it goes exponentially. But that happens at three halves log to the base two of n. So many, many metrics, we can do the analysis because they're formulas, and, um, and so that... Changing the shuffle, we can't do the math. Um, so Ed Thorpe, the blackjack card counting guru that people of a certain generation might remember, um, introduced a different model, which was, just to say another model, it's not realistic, but it was the first model anybody wrote down for shuffling, and it was the following. Cut the cards exactly in half, and then with probability of half drop left right, and with probability of half drop right left. So it's a very neat shuffle, right? You know, and then each time, and then repeat. And, um, and well, we can't get results it's, we can only prove log cubed n shuffles, and we, we, can't, we can't do the math. So, uh, and it's, of course, hard to test on a computer when, when n is 52. And so I don't know the answer to the, to the second question, but there is a part of my world that I work in, and it's called comparison theory. And um, it does say if you know everything about one Markov chain, and if you have another chain that's close in various senses, and I'll give an example in a second, then you know everything about the, the second chain. And using that, we're able to prove lots of ro ro robustness things. And let me just say one example. So, I, I got in my random transpositions change, you know, randomly transposed pairs of cards, and we analyze that. We know all the eigenvalues. It's a nice, everything's nice group theoretically. A different chain, very different chain, is if you ask a mathematician what are two elements that generate the permutation group, well, a transposition and an end cycle. Either switch the top two cards, put the top card to the bottom. It feels very different. It is very different. It's just got two generators. But using comparison theory, we can get very sharp results about, about more or less any method of shuffling. Um, and so uh, th there is a lot of effort. It's, of course, an important question because any, hey, you guys, the icing model, come on, that's about magnetism. I'm sorry. <laughs> I work on the icing model, too. So uh, no, but I mean, we do make up models that we hope are rough approximations. and uh, and. 
I don't know the answer to your second question, but the metric, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, if you ask a, a very, very, you know, a very funny question, so let me, the metric is the, it's the difference over subsets. But suppose you want to know uh, something like um, how many cards do you expect to get correct? You know, that's something that's not bounded. It depends, it could be up as much as n if you guess at them one at a time. And so we, we, can, we can do any of them, but it, the, the answer can change if you ask a funny enough question, and it's fine too. That's something for us to do. So, um, but, but I think I didn't lie to you about the metric, and I don't know the answer. I, I can't do the math carefully enough. To, uh, it's hard, it's hard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Methinks thou dost protest too much. Fair enough. Are there more questions? No complaints? Come on. For a perfect shuffle, it returns to itself in eight shuffles. Um, right, yeah, I don't, an eight and seven. I don't know what they have to do with each other. Uh, that, I mean, there's no, so. Uh, uh, the question is, a deck, so that first of all, I mean, there are two ways of perfect shuffling cards. You know, talking to me about shuffling is like talking to Californians about wine. You know, you're in trouble. So uh, there are two ways of perfectly shuffling cards. You can cut the, the cards in half, and then you go one, 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 so that the top card stays on top. Or you could do it the other way. Right, so that the top card goes second from the top. So they're called out shuffles and in shuffles creatively. Okay, um, it takes eight out shuffles to recycle 52 cards. It takes 52 in shuffles to recycle. So that's not a robust number. And the thing I find fascinating is that with all we know in mathematics, we can't answer the question: Are, are there large decks of cards which take their size to reshuffle. It becomes the question, is two a primitive root for infinitely many primes? And not in our lifetimes. Uh, so it's fascinating to me that there are questions about shuffling cards that all of mathematics can't answer. Bravo. Thank you. So, so I, there's, no, there's no pattern in the number of, it, that's the way random number generators work. So there's no pattern in the number of cycles, a number of perfect shuffles it takes. And it, it's not monotone. It, it, you know, that is, 64 cards take five out shuffles. So it's, it's just complicated. And, and we, 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 we depend on the fact that there's no pattern. It is the way random number generators work, uh, uh, multiplicative random number generators. So it's just an accident that eight and seven are close. That one I'm not going to try to explain. <laughs> All right, um, then let's uh, thank Percy one more time. Hope that was really what you wanted. <laughs> yeah.